Hello, Miamians. It is wonderful to be with you virtually for Winter College. This year, our alumni, parents, and students have access to Miami's top faculty and our outstanding alumni. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of those alumni, Wayne Emery, class of 1958. Wayne's illustrious NBA career as a basketball player, all-star and world champion, and as an executive has many firsts, including serving as the NBA's first black general manager and black team president. Wayne served Miami as a member of the Board of Trustees and is included in Miami Athletics Hall of Fame. Throughout his life, Wayne has exemplified love and honor through his passion to make Miami and the NBA more inclusive for all. Miami University will honor Wayne this spring with the installation of a statue in his likeness at Millette. Also, the 2021 Freedom Summer of 64 Award will go to both Wayne and his late wife, alumna, Terry Embry, for their, their life's work, work as civil, civil rights champions, champions mentors, mentors, and inspiration, and inspiration to, so to so many others. others. With, With leaders, leaders and alumni like Wayne and, and Terry Embry, Embry, I am confident, I am confident Miami, Miami will continue to advance, advance inclusive excellence, both, both in Ohio and around the nation. Thank you, Wayne, for all that you have done to serve the NBA and Miami. Love and honor. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. Yes, thank you, President Crawford, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Masechko from the Miami University Alumni Association, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session of Winter College 2021. For more than 17 years, Winter College has been an Alumni Association's premier alumni education event. We are so excited to be able to bring it to a broader audience this year with our virtual format. We have already had a number of amazing sessions, both yesterday and this morning, and we will continue these outstanding classes throughout the rest of today. You can navigate the full schedule by clicking Events by Type on this website's toolbar, selecting Winter College 2021 from the drop-down menu. Feel free to join programs, even if they're in progress. And if you can't make them all, or if you missed one, no need to worry the sessions will be recorded and posted online. Our session today is How Sports Can Move Us to a Great Society with Wayne Embry, class of 1958. Joining Wayne today is Miami Athletic Director David Saylor, and our moderator is Bree Robinson, Assistant Athletic Director for Leadership and Diversity. Before I turn it over to Bree, I just wanna remind you that you can submit questions during this session clicking on the blue hyperlink below the video. We do our best to get to all the questions, but we may not have time to answer every one. So with that, I'll turn the program over to Bree, David, and Wayne. Take it away, Bree. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, first of all, I want to welcome everyone. And I especially want to welcome Wayne, who is our guest of honor today. And David, thank you for joining us and participating in this conversation. Before we get started, I feel it, that it's only right for me to acknowledge all of the accolades and accomplishments of Wayne, because the list is pretty impressive. So um, obviously, Wayne, you're a 1958 graduate of Miami University. You have uh, been inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame. You were the first Black GM and president in the NBA. You are a two-time All-Max selection. Uh, you are a five-time NBA All-Star. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, and now you're receiving the Freedom Summer of 64 Award um, with your late wife, Terry. So thank you again for joining us today. It's good to be here. And David, you know, you just celebrated or, or reached the eight-year mark of being here at Miami uh, at the beginning of this year, but you have experience not only working in athletics, but also working in the private sector and doing some consulting, as well as serving at several other institutions. And, and looking at your resume, David, you've covered um, almost every region of the United States here uh, with your athletic related experience. So hopefully you'll be able to share some of what you've learned uh, throughout your tenure as an athletic administrator as well. Yeah, thanks, Bree. Looking forward to it. So my first question as we get started here, um, Wayne, you were a Miami student. I was a Miami student. And you know, over time, we've been able to witness the evolution 
of Miami University in many different ways. And so as we think about social justice and where we are right now, um, what do you think are some similarities and some differences between the fight for social justice when you were a student at Miami and what you're seeing in young people now? Well, we, uh, I was in Miami from 54 to 58, and it was before the civil rights movement. So there wasn't much activism on campus or around during those years. Things were pretty much as they were. Uh, and I gotta say, in Oxford, things were terrific because there wasn't many places we couldn't go or if, there's, if there were any, I didn't know what that was. And uh, of course we played games in the South and that's when I had first exposure to, to discrimination and and in that we had to not eat, eat in the same restaurants as the rest of our play, the players and the players uh, appreciate that they wouldn't go either. I remember a couple instances where we had to eat in the kitchen uh, and at the hotels where we stayed. And this was all before the civil rights movement. And I think in the 60s uh, is when Dr. King, John Lewis, and other great civil rights leaders uh, started their activism. And and uh, I think, uh, of course, they made a big difference. And I think as what we're saying today, is uh, maybe some backlash to what accomplishments and progress was that have been made. And uh, so I think that there aren't many similarities to when I was in school because it was what it was. But uh, after the civil rights movement, great progress was made and affirmative action programs and, and uh, the all out effort to be inclusive in corporate America as well as institutions. And uh, I think uh, what we're seeing today is somewhat of a backlash to maybe the progress that has been made and as we we're witnessing and, and experiencing, more progress is necessary. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, what I've identified is the students right now are pretty invigorated, right? And we realize that a lot of people are now behind this social justice movement and there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so David, can you share a little bit about um, over your time as athletics administrator, what you've seen in terms of the spirit of the students and what they're doing right now that, that really excites you and really makes it different right now? Well, there's just been so much more attention brought to the table and the, the student athletes have, uh, they're so inquisitive and they've asked so many questions and wanted to get more involved that it's really, the dialogue has really been sparked at a different level than I've ever seen in, in, this, in this industry. And I think that's a really positive thing. I think what we have to do as leaders of, of young people, coaches and staff and people in front offices of professional leagues is we've really got to not just put out reactionary statements, but thoughtful statements that, you know, include actionable items that, you know, people can grab hold of and take part. And I think that's really important. There's so many things facing these young people right now. When you think about all the different, you know, paying student athletes, name, image, likeness, transfers, the virus, you know, there's just what what really comes out of it to me that is needed for these young people is empathy. There, there's a huge need for empathy to try to put yourself in a position to understand what they're going through, what's hitting them, you know, on a daily basis and, and how we can help move forward with act, actionable things. That's really what what I focus on. And Bree's done a great job helping us with that here at Miami. But really what I see is a, a dialogue that's been sparked. And the key now is to really get that communicated properly and create those safe spaces so that allies can be created. And if we can get the right allies created and really start moving forward, that'll be when you see activism take hold at another level, I think, than we've ever seen it before. Thank you for that, David. So Wayne, you heard me earlier and obviously you experienced it, but you have blazed many a trail 
throughout your time um, working in athletics and also just in general um, as a student athlete. So what's been the most challenging part about being the first? Well, I had to overcome from typical stereotypes early on uh, that I wasn't qualified and uh, I uh, realized that uh, being the first, there is a, there is a uh, burden that one must adopt uh, because I had, to prove, I had to prove that I belonged. And someone asked me early on when I was uh, first named, did I see any significance of being the first black general manager? And my answer was, if it only is significant to others. But, it, but within myself, I knew that I had to be successful. And I had somewhat uh, worked toward being, doing more and working harder than anybody else with doing that job to be successful, to prove that I belonged. And uh, I know on my staff, there were those who said, would say I was incompetent to get back to me. And of course, that would inspire me even more. And so, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate to have the background that I had, the education that I had, and the experiences I had at Miami. And I said this quite often that whenever I doubted myself, I'd reflect back on uh, the pictures on the wall in Miami and the coaches I had in Miami. When you come from the same institution that Paul Brown and Woody Hayes and Paul Dietzel and all those great sports figures uh, had uh, an impact. I figured that if they could do it, I could do it. And so that that too inspired me. And uh, I just continued on uh, as if I were just a general manager, not particularly a black general manager, but a general manager with a job to do. And I think that that's so important that you made mention of hearing that you weren't qualified, but knowing that you were qualified and believing in yourself enough to continue and, and have the personal fortitude to be successful. Um, David, we're gonna transition and I have, I have a question for you because you know you, we, you and I have had many conversations about us empowering student athletes and also making sure that we have representation in our athletic department. Um, but how have you positioned yourself to create change while empowering student athletes, coaches, and staff at Miami to do the same? Yeah, Bree, it's a good question. And, and I do just want to take a minute to say um, I'm kind of in awe of being on this call with Wayne. He's just he's been such a, um, a friend to me and someone that's really given me great advice over the years. And it's, it's just an honor to share this platform with him. And I I can only imagine the burden of just carrying that, you know, people doubting you and you're just trying to do your job, but you've got all this other stuff attached to it. It's just, um, I know um, the athletic director down at Vanderbilt, she's the first African-American athletic director and female in, in the SEC. And I read a st an interview with her recently where she talked about kind of carrying the flag and, and what goes along with that. So uh, just a testament to Wayne and all that he's done over his career, certainly. So honored to be here with him. But with us in athletics, it, Brie, it, it, you've, you've been a big part of this. We created a position that you've stepped into as assistant AD for leadership and diversity. And um, I think you've done a fantastic job, you know, just having those dialogues with our student athletes and our staff too, because frankly, our staff needs to be more representative of what's going on. And, and we have been very intentional here at Miami in terms of trying to make sure that our staff is a reflection of what our student athletes look like. I think that's important role modeling for them to see. I think it's important for us to get those different perspectives and backgrounds into our department. So we've worked very hard at that. But for me, really uh, what it's about at the end of the day for our kids is helping them find their voice. And I don't care if that's a kid on the football team or a kid on the field hockey team. It really doesn't matter, basketball, soccer, whatever. Um, but those four boxes that we've created, you know, the dialogue, the communication, the allyship, and then really the activism. I, to me, if we can keep moving students through that 
that that metric, if you will, uh, advancing them to the next stage of understanding and involvement. At the end of that, I think that we're going to have people that have found their voice and found a way to make a difference. And that's really, at the end of the day, what I want to provide. And you bring up something really important, that piece of finding your voice. And I know I've shared that I've been able over the course of the last year to find my voice um, as a leader and also someone who is really committed to helping Miami University as an alumna and as well as a staff member um, change the history. So Wayne, as we think about where we need to go as an athletic department and also um, as we continue to try to make progress, what advice do you have for David as a leader during this time trying to press forward and really withstand the test uh, of, of this long fight? Well, after listening to his comments, I think he's done a terrific job uh, bringing you on board, of course, and, and I think uh, as we all in our respective positions, we have to be listeners and listen to what uh, the, the students, athletes that have to say and understand what their needs are and just, I think communication is a big word as well, communicate back and forth and, and uh, listen and, and uh, just keep building on what, uh, what you've done. I like that part about listening. And David alluded to this earlier and talked about empathy. But I think that the only way to really establish and build empathy is to be able to listen, to take a, a step back and listen to other people and then communicate openly and honestly. You know, over the course of the last year, I've heard many people say that they have sat down and had conversations with people who are different from them just to understand their perspective. Um, and I think that to your point, Wayne, David has done an incredible job of listening. Um, and, I, and I think that we'll continue to have success at my university as long as we are, we are uh, encouraged and empowered to continue to do that and continue to listen. Well, and along those lines, Bree, one of the best things we've done so far, and if people want to go back to our website, they can find it uh, on there. But um, one of our student athletes, Maj White, he's a men's basketball player, great student here at Miami. And he came to us and said he wanted to host kind of a, a recording session called Red Hawk Real Talk. And, you know, there's always that concern that if you give the microphone to the students, do you have to kind of monitor it? Are they going to say something inappropriate? Those kind of things. But my Jay came at it with such a, a conviction and a level of um, just belief that that they can make a difference in just having conversation. And I know, Bree, you were a part of recording those sessions and they really did a fantastic job. And to me, listening to those type things that the kids kind of do themselves is where I learn the most. And so I think those have been fantastic sessions that we've done here at Miami. Yeah, and I just wanna give a kudos to our student athletes because they don't have to lean into the discomfort of having those conversations. And same thing with our coaches who have been a part of those things as well, but they have, and they've trusted us and continue to have those conversations time and time again and be open and candid with us. And so I feel very fortunate to be at an institution where we can do that um, and continue to, to keep the main thing and, and the relevant topic of social justice at the forefront. And I think it's important to res rec recognize President Crawford and his wife Renata for all the work they've done. I mean, they've, they have been so willing to, to jump in and lean in and, and involve themselves in any topic around diversity and inclusion. They've just, it's really inclusive excellence in that area is what Greg preaches and he lives it every day. And I think that's important because for all of us at the university down, we, we learn from him and, and take our lead from him. And he's been fantastic in this area. He has, and that's actually, that's a great segue to my next question because we've seen many organizations talk about what their values are, but not necessarily uh, practice those behaviors and align um, their financial resources. And I think at Miami, we've done a pretty good job of developing groups and also making sure that there is follow through with the things that we're doing. Um, and I know the implementation of the DEI task force as well as the DEI implementation team are 
two of those things that I really think about as well as some of the positions that are being created as recommendations from those two groups. And so, you know, we've seen this happen in professional sport where there have been organizations that have said that certain things were important to them like social justice, but they have, necess have not necessarily included those people impacted or affected or made space for the most vulnerable to be a part of that change or um, elevate the, the voices of those people. And sometimes when they have included individuals, it's been uh, at the stake of them, them losing jobs or being excluded. And so Wayne, what do you believe to be best practices for organizations in developing campaigns centered around social justice and trying to balance the scales when it comes to racial equality? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, you gotta be honest and really realize what's going on and what's happening and encourage our <clears throat> young student athletes to, to be leaders uh, because I think sports could be a model for greater society regardless of what sport it is because you're competing against uh, other teams, other individuals, and you're coming together in team sports as the team. And in order to win, you play, you got to play for each other. You got to respect each other. And I think uh, to build a champion, you got to have mutual respect in that locker room, on the court, on the field. And uh, we, we developed that in sports. And I think we, should, we could be a model for greater society. And for our athletes to have the platform to demonstrate that as how they conduct themselves on the court, off the court, in their community and uh, represent their community and, and uh, their institution and themselves. You know, let's not forget, it. we do represent ourselves. We have to have self-respect. And uh, I think uh, using sports as a model should inspire our young people and and people who come and follow us because you got many fans who follow and so how we conduct ourselves is really important and we can make an impression on on uh, people and hopefully have an impact on society. Yeah, I like the whole notion that sport can be an equalizer, um, and I think that's what you were getting at. I want to bounce this back to David because Wayne brought something up that I know is uh, very important to you, David, and it's a part of our graduating champions mission, but integrity, right? And being honest. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this movement towards social justice really fits into the graduating champions mission? Yeah, absolutely, Bree. It's um, it's weaved with, within everything we do, I feel, in terms of we want to graduate our kids first and foremost, but we also want to make them champions and prepared for life. And that, I think the diversity and living in a world with diversity and, and understanding how to navigate that is a very important piece of that equation. And we, I believe we are one of the leaders on campus in this area. And I say that because Wayne hit the exact point. When our kids are in a huddle, they don't care where each other's from. They don't care, you know, what the situation is back home for somebody. They just want to work together and find a way to achieve a common goal together. And so they're way ahead of everybody else on this topic. Um, I know there are students that come to Miami and probably come from a, a background where they have not been around diverse groups, but I can assure you that our kids have by and large. And so I want us to play a leading role in that. And I think that's why we have embedded it into the graduating champions mission because I think it's something that we have a responsibility to um, be intentional about talking about and showing you know where we're where we're able to make um, progress with it and I think the last piece of it that I felt uh, my first couple years here I did not do as well was hiring staff and I think we've made a really a really big stride in that in my last six years, and I think we're prop we're in a better position now to kind of be having all these discussions than we than had we not addressed it, you know, back five six years ago. It would have been we would have been scrambling to kind of catch up. I feel like the way we've embedded it and everything we're doing, we've been able to really take what happened on the national level 
and move it forward quickly here at Miami into activism and involvement. Absolutely. I, I've said to myself several times that I was very grateful that I had the opportunity to, to get some practice uh, before I got thrown into the real game, right? Uh, this past summer. And so, you know, hats off to you, David, and again, our administration and our university for just being very forward thinking and proactive in, in that way and creating positions to make sure that we can continue to move forward as it pertains to diversity and inclusion. Yeah, I've, I've kind of chuckled sometimes a little bit inside because everyone created this new diversity leadership position, which is the one you hold, Brie, for us. And we created it, you know, two over two years ago. So we were definitely ahead on that. And then I know we came out and said we were going to give our kids off election day from any practice or competitions here at Miami. And then sure enough, it wasn't a week later, the NCA did it for all of college athletics. And so I feel like we've we've done some things for the right reasons and they've proven to be things that other people have done later as well. Thank you for that. So Wayne, what do you think that the NBA has done very well um, to really position themselves as opposed to some other sports leagues um, to take a public stance regarding social justice? Well, I think the NBA has been at the forefront uh, and have been for years. And I attribute a lot of that to the leadership of Adam Silver and David Stern prior to him uh, and the ownership uh, of the teams that uh, we promoted equal opportunity. And that's all we asked for, an equal opportunity. And to prove ourselves and, and see the progress of uh, the NBA has made in hiring of coaches, general managers, presidents, and of course on the court. But I think the NBA is an equal opportunity employer. And we are global. We have six continents represented in the NBA. And I think it's just tremendous that, you know, the world has come together uh, behind the sport of basketball. And uh, I think it's a great, again, I keep saying it can be a model for greater society because of the way we've come together and what we've done, the progress has been made. And our athletes have become very proactive and using their platform to promote social justice and uh, remind people that we are living in a world that uh, we are humans and human beings must have respect and mutual respect for each other. And uh, because disrespect brings about chaos and turmoil, which creates hostility, which leads into the isms, racism, sexism, and that can create hatred. And hatred can cause conflict, and conflict can destroy civilizations. So we got to continue promoting respect. That's a big word in my vocabulary. And I think if we can respect each other, respect the human race, we can overcome what issues we have today. And that's a great tie back to what David was saying earlier in regards to in the athletic world, there's this there's this equalizer. There's this one thing that everyone is striving or, or reaching to try to achieve, and that is the championship or the win. And I'll speak to my experience. And Wayne, I'm sure you maybe had some similar experiences, but my teammates cared about me as a person, and that care for me as a person superseded anything else. And so, regardless of what our differences were which we could talk about all day, regardless of what my differences were, uh, they had this, in, this insurmountable level of respect for me that really made me feel included and I think uh, contributed to my positive experience when I was here at Miami. So Wayne, you just talked a little bit about some of the things happening um, in the NBA. David, what parallels do you see between the NBA and some other professional sport organizations and then what's happening with the NCAA, with the Mid-American Conference, and then here at Miami? Oh boy, there's uh, a couple different levels there, but I would say the NCAA has helped institutions in making some progress. There's still a ways to go. 
with some things at the, at the NCA level. But I would use an example of the flags changing in the South as one that I think the student athletes at those institutions down in the South um, went hard after asking for that change to be made, as well as some politicians and some others. And they were able to affect that change. And I think those types of things are are powerful and they're, and they're really good. Um, the election day campaign that went on at the NCAA level and the voter registration rallies that we had here at Miami with our student athletes were, were fantastic. And I think something that a lot of people participated in for the first time, and it's really how we can kind of grow from there is going to be the important piece. But where I think there needs to be a lot more work at the NCAA level is giving more need to kids that need it. Um, I think we spent so much time talking about a scholarship and, you know, frankly, there's some kids that the scholarship's great, but it's nothing more than what mom or dad, you know, brag about to their friends. But there are other kids who desperately need that scholarship. And if they didn't have it, they wouldn't be coming to school. And so, you know, I, I've even really tried to challenge some people in leadership within the NCAA about do we even need the traditional scholarship model to exist? Should it be more of a Pell Grant based model, need based aid model where all, you know, a kid that really needs it gets their full education paid for? Um, and that happens across the board, regardless of sport. So, you know, I think my, my hope is that there will be more attention. I think this is where you get into some of the, you know, student athletes should be paid discussion that people have, um, their name, image, likeness. I, I, I would, I would like it more if the conversation would shift more to what kids need based on their level of aid that they need and, and trying to take care of that first and foremost. Thank you for that, David. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll go ahead and we're going to open it up to the audience to ask whatever questions they have. Um, for, and this question is for the both of you, but what, what advice do you have for athletes at this time, uh, leveraging the power and politics that exist within sport um, and their desire to participate in activism? Well, I, I think athletes have a platform. Uh, they're highly recognized. And as long as they present themselves in a respectful way and remain nonpartisan and establish what their purpose is and do it, uh, as I said, respectful for all people. And I think uh, they can have a great role and making change. See, I think the intent is to change the hearts and minds through many policies have, have changed through legislation and over the years. But I think we're in a situation today where we still must change hearts and minds of people. And we got to eliminate hatred. You know, I go to the 80-20 rule. I think 80% of the people in this world are great, terrific people. Maybe 20% just thrive on hate, hatred. And so I think uh, our athletes can be a very important part of making change there. We've got to change hearts and minds. Yeah, and I think, I think building off of some of those uh, concepts, Bri, I one of the things that I found fascinating is, you know, dealing with COVID has been so difficult on so many levels. But the one part of it I think that has been interesting to delve into more with our student athletes is how COVID and racism are similar and how they're similar is that, you know, the actions that a kid takes affect other people and recognizing that in terms of, you know, I want to take care of people around me. So I'm going to distance and wear my mask and do what I'm supposed to do. That's a selfless act that that's something you should do to help other people to take care of other people. And similarly, you know, how you behave around different groups of people affects other people. And so it's kind of like doing the right thing and trying to, um, as I told my two young boys, you know, you no, no one's born a racist. It, it's something that is, is, is pressed upon them. It's taught, it's learned, it's things that they see and, and observe. And so just realizing how what we do affects other people, it, to me, has been something that the COVID era has brought us as well as the social justice era, and they've happened kind of simultaneously, 
But if you link them together, there's actually a commonality there. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think that that's, that's an incredible point, talking about that selflessness and really bringing it back to um, the honesty, right? The honesty to, to admit when there's an issue and identify when there's an issue um, and have the integrity to do the right thing. But then also, David, what you were talking about with that empathy um, and, and being selfless enough to try to take on the perspective of another uh, and realize what someone else may be experiencing outside of your lived experience. So at this time, we're going to uh, welcome Mark back. Uh, Mark, are there any questions that the audience uh, has at this time? Yes, absolutely. Um, so this, this question is from Charles, um, and he asks, what can fans do to elevate and support women in sports, especially the WNBA? Uh, and uh, what do you think the NBA should be doing to achieve more gender equity between men's and women's basketball? Well, I think that the NBA has recognized WNBA. I was active at the time the WNBA came into existence and very much a supporter of it because I think uh, there's – Women want to play basketball too. And uh, so I think the, NBA, the WNBA has made tremendous progress over the years. And I'm really proud of what's happened in the NBA as it relates to gender equality. Uh, I looked at, did a count the other day, the number of, of uh, women coaches on the bench and behind the bench, and the number of women in the front office. And I think we have over 10 women referees now, which is tremendous progress and it's gonna to continue to grow. So we in the NBA are very proud of that. And I think it's only a matter of time until there's a woman coaching men's basketball and at the NCAA level. I, I, I really do. I think it's just a matter of time. It's gonna happen. One of the things that I'll add here is that I think that the NBA did a really good job in uh, helping the WNBA with endorsing even just their brand and trying to grow the game. And I think that type of collaboration and partnership is helpful just for the visibility of women in sport. And then also asking your question, you know, who's at the table or what opportunities are available for these people outside of my own identities? be able to help make room and make sure that we are providing more opportunities and not just for equality, so the, the max uh, matching numbers on each side, but also for equity and providing the resources for people to be successful. Awesome, great, thank you. Um, all right, the next one here uh, comes in from uh, Jonathan. Uh, and Jonathan asks, would, uh, would love to know Wayne's thoughts on Michael Jordan staying out of politics versus LeBron James using his voice and how maybe that affects their legacies. Well, they're two different people. I think, I think uh, make no mistake about it. Michael Jordan's been engaged in what to call it politics, but he's, just, he's uh, expressed his views on issues over the years and quite vocally. And uh, I think uh, given the time that we're in now, LeBron's getting more publicity because, and he's been active, very active, as we well know. And I, but he's getting more publicity about what he's doing. And uh, I don't know if it's because people were afraid to tell Michael to shut up and dribble, as happened with LeBron. But as I said before, and I may have said it during this session, or does it say that athletes can be vocal? They are entitled to First Amendment rights as well. And it's, of course, how it's done and how it's done in a respectful way and a nonpartisan way. I think that uh, athletes should have a right to speak up because we've done it over the years to try to bring about, uh, and I go back to the word respect, mutual respect, and try to change the hearts and minds of people. And that's what LeBron's trying to do. Absolutely great. Um, let's see, another one here um, comes in from Connie. Uh, Wayne, what skills do you think are most important 
for student athletes to develop in order to be successful if they make it to the professional level? Well, in the NBA, the game's changed. Shooting's become very much uh, a part of the game now with the three-point shot. And I think uh, developing your skill, uh, ball handling skill and uh, shooting skill is critical. And I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a tough climb, but uh, that's what we look for. And uh, of course, that would has always been most important to me is character. And character involves a lot of different attributes, work ethic and how you get along with people and what your purpose is again. Great. Um, let's see, we've got one that came in through our YouTube, um, folks that are watching on YouTube. Um, and that question is, um, how did Wayne, and this is from Michael, you can see it here at the bottom, how did Wayne get the nicknames Goose and The Wall? <laughs> how did I get the nickname Goose and The Wall? Well, I got the nickname Goose when I was uh, in high school because our coach took us to see the Harlem Globetrotters play. And of course, Goose Tatum could palm the ball with both hands and do all those various things. And I put my hand up and I could do the same. So all of a sudden I got the nickname Goose. And uh, the nickname Wall came when I went to Boston because of the pick I set. And uh, the commentators, radio commentators said it's like running into a wall. So I got the nickname The Wall. Oh, those are good nicknames. Um, I think uh, a, a question that I have um, is what maybe was your favorite Miami uh, memory, um, maybe on the basketball court, and then one maybe that was off the basketball court? Oh, you're really testing my memory, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, winning on the court is important. And going to the regional tournament, uh, winning the Mid-American Conference first, and then going to the mid the, the uh, regional tournaments uh, was exciting. You know, a small school like Miami uh, getting there. So uh, that, that was the highlight. Uh, well, off the court, boy, just interaction with people. And, uh, you know, I think college life is special. Uh, and the dorms. Pardon? College life, college life is very special. Well, yeah, I'm glad that uh, my daughter just reminded me. The best thing that happened to me in Miami was meeting my wife. That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, I had to be reminded of that. <laughs> um, we just had another one come in uh, from Mike. And he's wondering, what are the most important things that Miami alumni can do to support Miami student athletes. And this could, the David, this could be for you, Bree, and Wayne. Well, I think there's a multitude of ways. One of the things we've worked real hard at is trying to help them uh, with their careers after they graduate. And so alums that are connected in the fields within they work um, and can maybe help kind of mentor some student athletes as they enter the workforce um, or link up with majors that work for their industry and, and really try to help some Miami people. Um, you know, Martin Nance has, he played football here and he's moved up and he just got a job with the Vikings in the NFL. And some of the connections he made through to, you know, kind of moving up the ranks were Miami people that helped connect him. And I think that's, that happens in, everything that, you know, that's part of the reason you choose to go to Miami is the alumni base. And so I think the more we can help activate that at the student athlete level, it's critical. 
Um, the more diversity initiatives that alums can take part in, whether that's from financial perspective or whether that's just from their time, I think those are important pieces. And, and Bree has certainly been working with many people on different areas to, to do just that. I think David hit the nail on the head there, um, talking about uh, providing mentorship opportunities and career opportunities we often talk about whether our student athletes really uh, see themselves transitioning into the real world um, outside of their sport. Um, and I think Wayne is a great example of the fact that you can do both, right? You can be a great student athlete and win championships, and then you can, you can go on to have a great career as a professional athlete and then continue that on as an executive. And you know, David made mention also of, of Martin Nance, who was another great example of that. But I think um, being present and connecting with student athletes to remind them of the transferable skills, right, that they have, that they develop on the, in the athletic arena that trans, transfer out into the real world is really important. Um, and David also alluded to our DEI fund. So we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion fund that we've established um, over the course of this academic year to really be able to provide professional development opportunities um, for our staff, our student athletes, and continue to provide meaningful programming uh, that is a source of education for our student athletes. So I think that having those pieces in there and having alum uh, be able to contribute there would be incredibly helpful. I think attending games, and because I tell you, having been a student athlete, it's really an inspiration when you have fans and alumni, students there in the stands supporting you. It's an inspiration. Absolutely. Plus, it makes it more fun for the fans if there are more fans there to enjoy it. That's for sure. Um, one more. Let's see. You've got a couple more questions here. Um, Anne is curious. Wayne. Where do you see the NBA in five years? What changes do you hope to see? Uh, well, the NBA just keeps getting better. Uh, I think uh, five years from now, I just think there'll be more teams, and I think they'll continue with uh, with uh, inclusion and diversity and. I hope that uh, there are more young people who aspire, and I think uh, you know the NBA is, as I said a while ago, is global, and you'll start seeing more of that going forward. Great. Uh, let's see here. Um, another one I think came through. Yes, uh, through YouTube. Um, Joan Mann, um, just, well, that's just as a comment. Um, she wanted to say that I was your, uh, dorm counselor at Miami, Bob Mann. So it's from Bob Mann. So Bob was, uh, was, uh, I guess one of your residence assistants when you were here on campus. So that's pretty cool. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Um, let's see one more question here from, Less less asks Wayne. Do you think we will ever see an NBA team in Cincinnati again? That's a good question. It is a good question. I'd love to see it. Uh, I don't know. I think there's a few cities ahead. Seattle. I know there's been talk of Louisville. They'd love to have an NBA team. But I'd love to see an NBA team back in Cincinnati, and uh, we'll just see. I think uh, Cincinnati will support an NBA team now and today's NBA. Hey, and Mark, I, I would be remiss if I didn't chime in here for a minute on the NBA and, and what's happened with support of Wayne. Um, Greg alluded to this in his, in his video, but we are going to be unveiling a statue of Wayne out in front of Millette Hall in April. And uh, it's kind of his standard hook shot. It's going to be one of the tallest statues you've ever seen between the size and also his, uh, his hook shot. But what, what is really important is Jane Whitehead from Miami has worked very hard with Randy Ayers, who's an alum. Uh, and Randy has helped 
you know, push this, uh, you know, this topic of doing a statue for Wayne and the Gunn family who used to own the Cavaliers when Wayne worked there, they've contributed to, to making this happen. Uh, the Toronto Raptors, his current employer have supported it, the Milwaukee Bucks and the current Cavs organization, in addition to what Randy Ayers has done, has kind of, you know, spearheaded this program project to do the statue, but also to create a scholarship in Wayne's name. And I think that's an important thing that uh, we should highlight and celebrate, and everybody should be looking for that to happen in April. We're obviously going to do it um, around COVID situations and do it as safely as possible and get all of Wayne and his family here. But uh, the statue is off being made right now. I think Wayne has seen it and uh, given some tidbits of pointers he wanted to see tweaked here or there. But uh, it's a really exciting thing for us to be doing and, and really well-deserved for Wayne. I'm very appreciative, very honored. Absolutely. Let's see, I'm gonna check right one more time here. Yeah, that looks, I, it looks like those were all the questions that we had. Um, so um, unless there's any other questions, Bree, that you had for the group. I do not, I just want to say thank you to Wayne and David I mean, David, we work together every day, but it's still, it's an honor to just, whenever I get the opportunity to sit and talk to you and pick your brain and Wayne, it is an absolute pleasure to have an opportunity to see you again um, and, and get an opportunity to hear some of the things that are happening with the NBA and also just learn more about you. So thank you. Thank you, it's been a great session. Love and honor. Love Absolutely. and honor. Yes. So thanks. Thank you again, Bree. You hit the nail on the head. I want to thank all of you. Um, thanks so much, Bree, to you, David, and to especially to Wayne for your participation today. Um, our apologies for some uh, issues we had with video to start the webinar here. Um, we've had with our webinar provider. We're still planning to show all of the remaining sessions on our ALC platform. Um, in case, though, we have a technical issue, uh, we will post a YouTube link um, on that event page so you'll be able to, to get to the uh, video. So in speaking of sessions, our next session, which is college sports and the pandemic, Miami coaches in a conversation um, that will start at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and there are, are unique URLs for each session. Um, and so please refer to your registration confirmation email for those links um, to that presentation. So on behalf of Miami University Alumni Association, thank you all so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your Winter College 2021. Love and honor. Hey, everyone.